come sit over. This is the last panel of the day. Um, the bookseller got here, and he's got Ollie's ingredient book. Uh, Ollie, are you still here to sign them? Hopefully. Uh, so the bookseller is going to be over there. He's got several of our panelists' book, including what this panel is about, chefs, drugs, and rock and roll. Author Andrew Friedman is here. I'm halfway through the book. I'm loving it. You got to sign my book later. Yeah. He is also uh, has a podcast, Andrew Talks to Chefs. And he was just in Cayman Cookout, interviewed some amazing chefs down there. And we've got an amazing lineup. He's going to introduce them. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Thanks. Um, so just quickly, I'll say a word or two about the book and why I wrote it. And then I'll introduce the panelists you haven't already met at the uh, last panel. But the book I wrote, Chef Drugs and Rock and Roll, is the story of what I think of the bridge years in American chefdom. Uh, the book takes place from the early 1970s to about 1993. Um, it, it sort of bridges the years between a time when there really was no such thing as a famous American chef, uh, where if you had found your way into a kitchen in this country, you had probably taken a very wrong turn somewhere in your life, uh, when there was no clear path of training, really, for American chefs, and when there really wasn't beyond sort of regional cuisine that wasn't celebrated, uh, an American canon of iconic restaurant dishes. Uh, you know, these days, obviously, we live at a time where the profession is, is somewhat glamorous. It's seen as at least possibly a road uh, to fame, maybe fortune, or at least to respect and success. Um, it's very much a sort of given now that chefs are going to define their own style at some point in their career. Uh, there are several different choices available out there, very well-honed pathways for chefs to follow. And the story I wanted to tell was the story how we got from that first time period I just described to the time that we all, most of you all work in, where somebody like me gets to eat in uh, today. So that's what we're going to talk about. There's some very important, pivotal people here on stage, and I'm um, looking forward to the conversation. So let me just introduce, uh, just going from the end to this end, Farmer Lee Jones of the Chef's Garden in Ohio. Very important figure in the, what I consider the sourcing revolution in this country. Uh, chef Bruce Hill, chef of a number of restaurants in San Francisco. I'm keeping these short, by the way, because we have six panelists and only about an hour, so if you do the math, we don't have a lot of time for each speaker. I can't talk. I can't Not true. Uh, of course, Jeremiah Tower, the man of the moment. Um, you know, in a, I know his book, Start the Fire, is one of the books that will be available during the book signing today and tomorrow. Obviously, a legendary figure who you just heard from in the last session. Um, the Last Magnificent, I assume many people here have probably seen. Uh, Going to be fed at a dinner tonight. And uh, I don't think I've been with, on stage with you since maybe Chicago four or five years ago. So this is exciting for me. So good to see you again. Likewise. Chef Grant McPherson, again, uh, for those who missed the last session, a native of Scotland. <laughs> Has worked over four decades in five continents, I'm told and currently has a consultancy based in Las Vegas by the name of Scotch Mist. Ken Frank started his career in Los Angeles, uh, was the original chef, actually, of Michael Santa Monica. Uh, <laughs> then opened a restaurant called La Toque, and La Toque is now based in the town of Napa and been doing very well for a very long time. And Chef Barbara Lynch again, one of the great chefs of the East Coast, the contemporary queen of Boston restaurants, uh, and someone else who came up at this time. So, okay. So, having said all of that, Ken Frank, can we can we start with you? I was you know I was listening to the last panel, and there was some conversation about the importance of travel. Um, you know, I think that for your generation of cooks, 
it wasn't just travel as inspiration along the, the route of a career, but a lot of people who had kind of grown up on, you know, industrialized food in this country, not eating particularly well. Travel was actually the thing that sparked their interest in cooking. Uh, and you had that experience very young. You're one of the few people of your generation that wasn't what we would call a career changer today. Can you just speak to how you found the kitchen and what it was like committing to that? Well, travel to me was, was part of my being in the right place at the right time. When I was 15, my dad was a teacher and he got a sabbatical and moved the family to France for a year. And we lived in a village of 307 people on the French side of Lake Geneva. And I went to French public school and ate in the cafeteria every day. Better food than restaurants were serving in America at the time. And it was, there was no grand plan. That's just where we were. And at the end of the year, I wanted to stay, so I got a job as a dishwasher. And I've been working ever since. But I do think travel is really key. And I think that it was our clientele that was traveling and going to Europe and going to Italy and going to France and eating better the same way I, as, as a teenager did, it was the clientele at the same time that was awakening when we young chefs were going, hey, we can do this our way. We can use better products. We can put our own ideas on the menu. And so, so travel was really and, and remains one of the best things you could do. Can you just talk for one moment about what it was when you decided to commit to the kitchen? Like I remember you telling me, I think you're what did your friends in high school call you, like cookie or something like that? Uh, I, I cooked hamburgers at a local ski resort on weekends to make the money go back to France. Yeah. And my nickname was Frenchie. Frenchie, that's what it was. So, so can you just talk, but how, how, you know, when committing to do that so young, I mean, we're talking the 1970s here, what was, it, what was the reaction from your friends, from family, from people you met who you told that's what you were doing? So I went to a very prestigious private school in Pasadena. I was ultimately the only one in my senior class that didn't graduate from college. Uh, but I, th the plan was always to go to college and be either a marine biologist or a doctor. And I got to UC Irvine and I was going to cook to pay my way through college. And after a couple months, I was working at the best restaurant in Newport at the time called Ambrosia. And I realized, you know, I hate college and I love cooking and I think this is what I want to do. So I moved back up to Los Angeles and got a couple good jobs. I took leave of absence from UC Irvine, which I'm still on, and I've been working in good restaurants in the U.S. ever since and I'm largely self-taught here. Yeah, I just have to say, it occurred to me as you were talking, it's funny to me that you were cooking hamburgers and because you were cooking, your friends called you Frenchy and you know, a derogatory name for Americans in a lot of French kitchens was actually Chef de Hamburger. So it's, it's kind of funny. I still love hamburgers. It's one of the best foods ever. Yeah, you're living in a good time. Okay. Bruce, can you talk about when you came up, you, you came, made your way from the East Coast to San Francisco. Right. You went to work for Stars. Mm -hmm. I, I, th I think something that's very hard for people to fathom today is how very small the community of emerging restaurants and chefs in this country was, yeah. um, how many targets of employment there would be for somebody like you with the ambitions you had, mm -hmm. but at the same time, how spread out it was, you know, and, and, and how, how people came to, like, intel about where to go. Can you just speak to that aspect of what it was like back in the day? Yeah, you know, I, rem I remember really well doing my research, because I knew I was going to go to San Francisco. I had a friend, he had a couch I could sleep on. And I did the research, and the only place to look was Gourmet Magazine. And I literally read the review of stars in Gourmet Magazine, and I said, gosh, this is my number one shot. I'm going to you know, try other places, but my number one choice is stars. And I literally drove a motorcycle across the United States, showed up at stars on a Tuesday, got turned away, Showed up again on a Tuesday, got turned away, and I think it was the third time they said, start tomorrow. Yeah. Was that, I mean, I've heard a lot of the stories like this about Star. Inevitably, they often involve the fact that somebody had just left the day before or gave yep. note. It was just really a matter of persistence and timing. Yeah, I took the spot of Brendan Walsh, who had just left and gone to New York City. Who's yeah. now the dean of the Culinary Institute of America. Yeah, see? Yeah. <laughs> 
Jeremiah, what was it like on your end of all this? Like having these young, you know, this sort of quickly growing population of young American aspiring cooks that really, like when you were certainly back at Chez Panisse, this barely, this didn't exist. No, it didn't at, at Chez Panisse. I mean, uh, most of the cooks I ended up at Chez Panisse started as dishwashers and then someone would quit and I'd say, come over here. Because there were three or four dishes to cook, I'd do two of them, and I'd say, "Cook this now." And w one of the dishwashers got it about 90 percent. And I said, "You know, we'll all wash dishes tonight, but you're cooking now. You're a cook." So it was there wasn't much at hand. You just took the kind of people that you thought had the passion and the and the work ethic, and you hired them, and then taught them, and then they taught you. <laughs> and by <laughs> the time both ways. By the time you get to Stars, so right. Stars is opens in '84. Um, that's about 12 years after you arrive at Chez Panisse. Right. What, what, how was, how was it different in terms of what you were seeing in the way of talent, um, and how would you compare it to today in terms of, you know, I think again something that's very hard to grasp today. The skill level today is compared to the baseline back then, pretty astronomical. You know, you watch a show like MasterChef Junior, and you see these 10-year-olds doing things. I, I said to someone recently that I thought some of those kids could probably have worked in New York kitchens in the 80s, and they cracked up, but I actually wasn't joking, you know? Um, but in those 12 years, how, how, did the, how did the baseline ability change? Well, I mean, recently, a couple of years ago, I took the uh, very slim chance of working at Tavern on the Green to try and turn it around. And I was completely astonished the difference between uh, the labor pool then uh, and back in 1984. And it's, I think it's the reverse of what you just told me. So after I left, Anthony Bardan and Mario Batali and everybody said, Jeremiah, why, why are you hiring white kids? You should be hiring Latinos. I said, well, you didn't tell me that you know, when, I, when I started this. But I'll just tell you one story that it was a guy, who was, he was making fettuccine, and his phone rang, and he pulled out, he was 25 years old, non-Latino, and he pulled out his phone and started answering it. And I went over to him and said, what are you doing? I mean, don't you understand the skill that you should know is when to send the fettuccine, so by the time it gets to the table, the sauce is just pulled to where you want it. And he said, what's your problem? And I said, you are. Get the fuck out of here. You know, but that would, never have hap that would never have happened in 1984 because everyone wanted a job and nobody, including me and all the rest of us, thought we knew what we were doing. Thank you. It was just cooking. Yeah. Barbara, can you talk a little bit about how you first, um, you know, to me in a lot of ways, you um, kind of exemplify a certain type of East Coast cook. Um, someone who sort of found the kitchen very much by accident, um, didn't particularly have a love affair with school. <laughs> uh, can you just talk about how young you found the kitchen and what it was that drew you there? Because I think it's something that an awful lot of people relate, even today still very much relate. It's one of the things I think that hasn't changed. Well, um, okay, so I'll try, I'm gonna keep this quick. Um, so cooking is really the only thing I know how to do. And I'm definitely self-taught. I never graduated high school. I just I was one of those kids that they put me in the special class, not knowing I had a severe ADD and I was dyslexic. Not only that, I was the last of seven kids. My, my mother raised a single, you know, single parent. And we lived in a housing project. So the chances of me being where I am today is like, I don't, it's crazy, right? But honestly, if I could cook, I knew I'd always have a job and that's what I went for. And um, when I was in that kitchen, and I have to say, Gourmet Magazine was, I called it armchair travel. It, it, it was hard to read the stories, but it made me feel like I was in Provence. Like, uh, you know, I remember reading in Gourmet about quail eggs en jelly. I didn't even know how to say it. It was like, but I knew I wanted that. And I, so there was this fascination of that's how I wanted it. I, then I worked in a, in a private club for a good long time with my mom and her eight friends. 
From there, I went to the Harvest in Cambridge, and then somebody from Todd English's kitchen phoned and said, we, we think you'd be a good fit here. And I didn't even, you know, I couldn't even pronounce radicchio at that point. Um, so from there, um, what I did see was the amazing passion that like Todd English has, and he had that, like, he spent time in Italy, travel, you know, he brought that to us. He was just crazy, and, but I loved that chaotic atmosphere. I love seeing an ocean of white coats. I mean, I just, and I love fucking teamwork. And you know what, I also love seeing success. And I think that's what, what drove me to fuck, do it. Like, be different, because I've always been different. I've never fit in. It, there's no difference right now, but I own it this time. I, I'm happy with that. So I, I love being original. And I also love giving what people want. It isn't, you know, they're out there. They're, they want good food and simple sometimes, not so complicated. Um, and that's it. Did that, how was that? Yeah, good. great. Right. <laughs> great, as usual. <laughs> Grant, can you just speak to, um, what, what made you want to come to the U.S. initially? And, and can you speak to maybe the, the differences in the, cult, the chef culture in this country? It's obviously changed, but I'm thinking mainly about when you first came here. Um, uh, you know, kitchen culture, restaurant culture. What, what, what differences did you discern or hear that made it, um, you know, other than what you'd experience maybe elsewhere in your travels? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a good question because, you know, I was born in Scotland and was pretty close. I grew up in Canada and then I traveled to Australia and was in the Far East. And my first call was to uh, come to the Bellagio. And I really I heard about Las Vegas and, you know, being in a, a city like Singapore where everything's live and the techniques and this, the sense of the detail is very different than being in the U.S. And even 20 years ago, I think we were very advanced. We may have, maybe not have knew what was going on in the rest of the world, but there was a very, a very high level of um, quality. You know, working with chefs like Alain Ducasse and Joel Robichon and uh, Gerard Boyer and all the three-star Michelin chefs came to the raffles in Singapore. So when I first got a call, I wasn't really interested. And then I got another call, and then I said, okay, well, you know, I've never been traveling business class, why don't I ask for a business class ticket just to see if I could get one. And sure enough, I got a business class ticket to Las Vegas, and that was 20 years ago, so it came through the fax machine. There was no emails and any of that shit. So seven pages of stopping in Bangkok and Tokyo and Narita and wherever else. I don't, it was probably a $600 ticket, but I was, to, I was just excited that I had a business class ticket. And once I got to Las Vegas, I saw the hotel, which was the Bellagio, and I had no idea what that was. All I knew is my good friend Jean-Louis Paladin was uh, in a nearby hotel uh, called the Rio. So I went back and thought, thought about it, and I, and I said, okay, if I'm gonna take this job, I need a green card. So I just said, okay, if I can get a green card, I'll take the job. So I haven't looked back since. Uh, Las Vegas at that time was not, there was only, you know, Mark Miller, there was Wolfgang Park and John Louis Pelleda. There was no celebrity, sh the celebrity chef thing hadn't hit yet. I don't want to be long-winded, but it was a great time to show up there. And I was very fortunate to work with great chefs and males and females. And, and, and it, was a, it, was, it was a special time. Jeremiah, Grant just mentioned that, you know, the celebrity thing hadn't quite happened yet. You were one of the people that sort of first defined that term. Um, you know, you very famously were at the center of a doer's uh, ad that they spent a lot of money circulating around the country. You were on billboards. Um, uh, you were on late night television shows, you know, and being recognized in the street. When that first happened here, how much did that surprise you? And what was, what was it like from inside your being to experience that in a profession that, at least in this country, had never seen anything like that happen before? In 1983, we did a, a lunch at the Astor Mansion in Newport. Uh, a PR agency for Ocean Spray said, "Would you? we're doing this huge event with Guy Savoie, showing cuisine without butters, cream, sauces, all that sort of thing, which is complete rubbish. He did all of that. But anyway, it sounded good. And we just need, you know, a little lunch. And we got there, 
And my hero of the, of the event is Stephen Drainan sitting right over there. Raise your hand, Steve. Yeah, Stephen. So we got to the kitchen in the morning to cook, and there were 100 journalists uh, for, the, for the lunch. We got there, and the French said, get out of here, you know, you California kids and everything. So cut a long story short, I thought, right, I'll, I'll show you. So we lined the grills, six six-foot grills, on the lawn right in front of the 100 journalists. And the result, and we overfed the journalists. Two weeks, whole page food section. Is it new American cuisine? And that's well, not the first time. So we're in the plane going back, and it was a huge success. I could tell that, you know. We drank a couple of cases of champagne while we were cooking, so it was obviously very good. I was in the plane, and Stephen looked over the seat at me, and I was just there, devastated. He said, "Oh my God, what's wrong?" I said, we've really fucked ourselves now. That was such a huge success that life is never going to be the same again. And it never was. From then on, we were riding the tiger. Of, yeah. What of, do you mean by that expression? It's one of my favorite expressions I've ever heard. You're, where did you get that expression? Is it your own? I don't remember. I just know it all my life. But it's, you know, you ride a tiger, and sooner or later, it turns around and bites you. <laughs> you just hope it isn't fatal. And that's, that's publicity. But I didn't understand what was going to happen or what it was really about until that moment. Before that, everything we did was just to fill the restaurant. I mean, so that I could pay myself more than $400 a month. Yeah. Okay. Farmer, can you speak to, you know, anybody... Uh, it was a little bit easier on this coast. Um, it was really hard on the East Coast for various reasons. The whole, what I think of as the sourcing revolution. You know, Jeremiah has talked in different various places, including to me, about, you know, f finding fresh herbs even back in the early days. Um, you know, you talk to a chef like Larry Forgione, who was at, a, at River Cafe and then at American Place, who at one time in his early career was spending, he said, about half his time on the phone, calling around the country, trying to find quality ingredients. And then this was pre-FedEx, having people figuring out how to get it shipped to him, right? You... I don't know if people know this, Chef's Garden was not even the original name of your family's farm. That was a change you made in the 80s. Can you ex tell, explain how it was that you first realized um, that there was a need for what you all could provide um, and, and how you became aware of this sort of growing kind of early group of American chefs um, who were looking for quality products that by and large didn't exist here? Well, we had no clue about the culinary world. I mean, it was a big deal for us to uh, go to a Ramada Inn on Sunday after church for a sirloin steak. We knew nothing about the culinary world. And we were vegetable farmers for commercial. And in the uh, late 70s, early 80s, interest rates at 21%. We had a hailstorm that wiped the crops out. We lost the farm. We were desperate for a way to be able to survive in agriculture. And we met a European chef, Jean-Louis Paladin, who had come over here from the Watergate Hotel uh, in the late 70s, early 80s. And he was looking for those same ingredients he was used to in Europe. And, you know, he said, if you want to grow for me, you must figure out how to grow. The food is shit in America. <laughs> he was, he was kind of shy. Now, I have a great story on Jean-Louis that we don't have time to tell anybody later that wants to hear that story. It's amazing. Jean-Louis and that whole era, I mean, they worked hard, they played hard, and, you know, it was a foundation for where we're at today. But he recognized we were really passionate about finding a way to survive in agriculture. We wrapped our arms around both of his legs and we wouldn't let go. And he recognized we were willing to do it the right way, the way he wanted, and he turned us on to Daniel Ballou and Alain Ducasse and jean George von Richten. And the Ritz-Carltons were steeped in um, European chefs. And so we then hooked on with the Ritz-Carltons and the Four Seasons and the St. Regis's. And then the American chefs were looking for those ingredients. And it, we lost the farm and came along at the right time. And those, I mean, it is just, it's amazing to get to sit up here with these. These are freaking rock stars. And these chefs have allowed us an existence in agriculture. Sex, drugs, we're, and rock and roll. 
We're, that's right, and it was, and it, but it built a foundation for us to move forward today. And you know, it's just been a, an amazing journey. And the chefs have allowed us an existence and really taught us as farmers what you're looking for, how to grow it, the way to grow it, what's important to you. And you've continued to teach us all along, and it's just been an amazing journey for us. We're Thank grateful. You. Can you just, just quickly, because I think it's an amazing story, and it really shows how much things have changed. There was a chef, was she from Chicago? Who came to farmer's markets looking for a particular ingredient. Uh, back, this was one of your early chef customers. And um, she had been going from farm stand to farm stand, and people thought she was really strange, and Want that? That's not something we sell, right. right? And you were the only ones who kind of heard her out and decided to meet the, her, the her request name, she was yeah, making. Her name what was were, Iris Balin. What was the ingredient? Because it's she what? was a she was a, uh, a, a chef for a private company in Cleveland, and she kept looking for ingredients like she'd experienced in Europe, and she couldn't find them. And she kept going to farmers and asking them to if they would grow squash blossoms for her, and all of them were like, "Are you kidding me? You know that's crazy," and it was my dad, my brother, and I. We, we worked together and farmed together. And my dad said, Iris, how many farmers have you been to to try and get them to grow that? And she sheepishly admitted it was about 20. And my dad said, what did they say? And they said, you're crazy. We won't do it. And my dad said, OK, we're in. And that was the beginning. And that was in the early 80s. And it's just been an amazing journey ever since. And ch Chicago, I mean, Charlie Trotter did more for our family than we could ever repay. Sure. Uh, so many um, stories. Ken, can you talk a little about what the culture of um, restaurants was like in Los Angeles in the late 70s and early 80s? It's, LA's, def, LA's having a huge moment right now. Um, if, I assume if everyone saw their April Fool's article about New York, if not, it's classic. Um, but, uh, I mean, the LA Times is article. But, um, you know, I, I think, Jeremiah, I think you've spoken this way a lot. L.A., I think, historically is really undervalued, especially in the era that you were there. Can you just speak to what was going on in kitchens there and what the environment was like for a young chef? Well, in the, in the mid-'80s and in the mid-'70s and, and early-'80s, it was a very exciting time. Los Angeles had always been considered kind of behind New York, behind San Francisco. But there were quite a few young European chefs that had arrived in Los Angeles who were really good at the right time. Most famous, of course, being Wolfgang, but there were actually another five or six. And we had the tremendous advantage in Los Angeles of having, we were on the West Coast. Uh, we, had, we already had access and still do to, I mean, in California, we take great produce for granted. And we had the best produce then, and we have the best produce now. I mean, what what's been accomplished in the last 30, 40 years is amazing, but even back then, it was astounding the freshness and the quality that, that we could find. And this is back in the day when shallots were exotic, raw button mushrooms were exotic, uh, fresh basil did not exist unless you grew it and nobody did because nobody knew what it was. Flat leaf parsley was, was a big deal because, of course, there are two kinds and the flat leaf is the good stuff. But it was a very exciting time and, you know, I, for a couple of years, I think Los Angeles was perhaps the most exciting place to eat in America. Certainly tied, uh, but then that stopped. You know, and Los Angeles is really is having a moment now. But certainly in the 90s and early 2000s, Los Angeles was a place where it was more important what chair you were sitting in and what restaurant you were at than what you were eating. And in all the other cities, what was most important was, are you eating the best stuff? In Los Angeles, it was about, did you get your picture taken? Did you get your regular table? And I just got tired of people asking for sauce on the side. Fuck this, I'm leaving. So, Can you just really, because I think it speaks to um, the change that happened at this time. There's a detail that I just love that you told me. I think it was when you were at La Guillotine, I think. Uh, great name of a restaurant, La Guillotine. Um, I think that was it. But this really speaks to sort of the dominance of French cuisine time and also the sameness of French cuisine, right? Most French restaurants, and not just here, were largely serving the same roster of dishes. You ha there were two dishes on an early menu of yours that had asterisks next to them on the menu. Can you explain what those were and why the asterisks were necessary? So that would have been 1976. I was 21. It's 
It's my first job as lead chef at uh, La Guillotine, which ultimately would turn into La Toque a number of years later. Uh, and I had worked at a couple of really great French restaurants in L.A., uh, but the owners of La Guillotine, when we opened, let me write my own menu. So I wrote a menu of my favorite specials that I had learned to do working at these different restaurants because there were a dozen restaurants in L.A. at the time that had exactly the same menu. They all had some kind of fish, almondine. They all had some kind of sweet cook for the second time till it's dry as fuck duck with some kind of different fruit because one place would do pineapple, one place would do cherries, one place would do peaches, and it was just boring, boring, boring. Everybody served tart tatin for dessert. So I put together a menu and it had two items on it with a little asterisk, which were my creations. And at that time, in LA, in, in the US, to put your own idea on a menu was pretty radical. And to do anything but that now would be crazy. Yeah. So the asterisk explained these are the, because people were disoriented. These are mine. They were disoriented. You've never what, had this what are before. These? Yeah. Um, so can we just, Barbara, let me ask you first, can you talk about, because um, this was a time where a lot of young, uh, a lot of young American cook chefs um, were just, no pun intended, devouring knowledge, doing really, you know, you, you hear from a lot of people at that time, you know, they'd work these crazy hours, go home, look at cookbooks till they fell asleep, go out on their night off, you know, they were just, you're just soaking it up, right? There was a dining population that was also slowly discovering more sophisticated food. Can you talk about how that, what that relationship was like when you started cooking in terms of, did people always understand what you were doing? Was there a certain amount of uh, education that had to happen in the dining room? Was there a certain amount of explaining that had to happen in the dining room? Oh, yeah, I mean, people as in customers, yeah, the butcher shop, that was fucking crazy. No one could really understand it. Like, do you, is it a butcher shop? Do you go and order meat? What do you do there? And you can also have a glass of wine and you can, you eat meat, <laughs> a lot of it. Or, but we also had tongue and sweetbreads and rabbits and birds with feathers on. So it took six years for it to like get, then there's, so then there's a cult that actually loves that. And that's a small world that probably had that same experience when I went to Italy for the first time. Um, and I brought that with me. And that was my version of it. But I was also like, why do I have to fucking go to the North End all the time for rabbit? Why doesn't every neighborhood have a butcher shop on the corner? So that was, that was the most difficult one, I think. Uh, did that answer your question? A little bit, but I was wondering, even in the earliest, uh, your earliest uh, restaurants, if what you were doing required, you know, you heard these stories like, you know, the most famous, well, not most famous, the most famous example to, to my mind was, you know, Jean Bonchet, who was a chef outside Chicago, used to send foie gras out on the house because he was trying to teach people what it was, right? Oh, like, wow. did you, was there anything like that in your background where you had to, where customers needed to sort of be brought along to what you were trying to do? Um, no, I mean, they didn't like the fact that I started, I, I sort of mastered it. I just wanted to learn French cooking. I, want, I loved the precision. I love the attention to detail, you know, and I, I wasn't taught that. So, you know, I was like, I need that. I need that, but I can't give, I can't give what I really love is Italian food. I mean, I just love Italian women who cook. They're raw, they're, you know, it, it's usually, it isn't about them, it's about the fucking meal they're putting on the table. So, I just lost my train of thought. That's okay. Say, but like, where was I? Remind me, just like. The quite, well, whether or not they so needed yeah, to no, be brought no, along. Customers need to be, but like, no, that's, that's belittling a customer. It's like, geez, just give me a chance, I'm gonna put this out and I hope you love it. Um, and if you don't, come on in the kitchen and talk to me about it. Because, I mean, I wanna make everybody happy. You want people to be happy. I mean, that's a challenge and I fucking love that. But I cooked my ass off because you know why? 
I could, every day I'd say, I want Marco Pierre White here. I'm going to cook like Marco fucking Pierre White's going to walk in the door. And like, uh, he did 10, 10 years after. And um, I, I loved it. The That's great, great White Shark. He wrote on Lydia Shire's uh, chef coat. I called Lydia. I'm like, you're never going to believe who walked in the door. Um, That's great. So Can customers are everything. But... But if you let them run your restaurant, you're fucked. Just saying. I mean, you are. Because I, ha I have to say. Also, telling you the truth. If they're not coming, then you gotta, you know, you gotta hear that, and um, I take that as a positive to make changes. I guess. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I have to say, before we started, Barbara asked me if she could swear. Did and, I swear? And I time? did you? I think I did. Yeah. yeah once or twice. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, my answer was, people always ask me that, then no one ever does it. So thanks for not wasting the question. Awesome, thank you. Thanks for allowing it. Uh, Jeremiah, can you speak to a um, similar question to what I asked Ken? You know, the, the spirit of that time, when Stars was flourishing, um, how, you guys, how you went about writing the menus there? Um, and what was the relationship between you and your cooks and your clientele? Well, it was, you know, I think it was either the first or the second open kitchen. So the kitchen had a very intimate uh, contact with the, with the clientele. And across from the kitchen was this 50-foot long bar uh, so that the bar crowd and the customers and the, all the cooks and the chaos in the kitchen, well, not chaos, but organized chaos in the kitchen, made for an, an, an amazing dynamic. We changed the menu for lunch and dinner every day, uh, seven days a week. So everybody did. And we were, I was talking with Stephen the other night of how it was done, and Mark Franz was the, basically the chef de cuisine. And in the beginning, I, mean, I we did the first menu and did the menus for a while, and then it became a teamwork. You know, Dominique Prin tells the wonderful story that she, when she, the first day at work, I came in and said, this is what we're cooking, and I told her verbally, and she said, you know, I was, she says, I was wondering what the recipe, where's the recipe, what are we doing? And I said, well, just cook it together. You know, so we did it in 10 minutes, we cooked it, and I, and, and I said, well, what do you think? She said, I love this, and I said, well, I love it too, so cook it. And that's the way it, it was, but it was, of course, much more organized than that. But there was always a possibility of a chef or a cook coming and saying, I'd love to do this. At the Santa Fe Bar and Grill, I, uh, Nations Restaurant News the other day asked me about you know, teamwork and could you rely on everybody? And I said, yes, it was one Monday night, rainy winter night at Santa Fe Bar and Grill in Berkeley, and we left Paul Carrara in charge. And I came back the next day and I realized he had served fettuccine with cherries Chartreuse and something else weird. Huh? Sorrel? Yeah. So sorrel, cherries, fettuccine, and chartreuse. I mean, if, if I had to come up with something that was the most disgusting thing I've ever heard, that would, would be it. But that didn't happen very often. And Bruce can... I was going to add that I got to spend some of those evenings in the office after service planning the following day's menu. And the one thing that was left out here is sourcing. This, the purchasing department at Stars always knew ahead what proteins were coming in, what seafood was coming in, and of course, all kinds of contacts with farms. So we would have a list of ingredients and we would be playing mix and match and putting them together for the following day's proposed menu. But that menu was never finalized until we cooked everything and tasted it all. So it was another step the next day, tasting, running around at five o'clock and making sure everything was right, and then finalizing the menu. Let, to put it in perspective, when I started, let's say 1972, 73 at Chez Panisse, every single thing that you can find at Whole Foods today, well, Whole Foods a year ago when it was great, at Whole Foods today, did not exist. Now, I can all see your eyes glazing over because you don't believe me, but it was absolutely true. Um, I used to go down to CNR Meats. It was the only place that didn't have, that had meat that wasn't frozen. And the calves would come in on a, on a 
runner, like a zip line from the truck down into the thing, and I would stand there with my basin, and I would grab the kidneys as the, as the animals went by, take them back, and then, of course, half the people in the dining room would say, I don't like kidneys. I'd go out into the dining room and say, I just cooked those kidneys myself, eat them. And they say, oh, I love kidneys. Yeah. They didn't dare not eat them. Uh, Grant, can you talk about a little bit about um, your, uh, you work on a lot of different types of projects today. Um, how do you go about approaching different, as a chef, right, who obviously have your own style, um, how do you go about doing what you do in, in so many different ways? Well, I think it's really understanding your client because, you know, everybody's got their own strengths and weaknesses and finding the team that you're going to get into. First of all, you, nowadays you want to work with the people you like to work with. It doesn't matter how much they're paying you, but you want to understand what they need. Recently, I did a project through the holidays up in Montana. Been there a few times, checked out the place, and realized that, uh, and even when I did the scope of work, you know, they had nine restaurants to fix up. Not just fix up, you gotta rewrite the menus, you gotta look at the recipes and end up, you know, doing 250 dishes on a couple days, replating, trying to get things, just like Jeremiah said, out of the freezer. You have, uh, you know, a client that owns a $15 million home who are used to, you know, having dinner in New York or Los Angeles or Chicago you know, one of the great cities, and finding out that it's not great. So, you know, it's really understanding the people you're working with. Would you have been able, when you started cooking, you know, like you talked about coming over initially and some of the chefs you were working with and knew, the kind of work you do today, the scope of it, the different applications of it, would, was that, would you have been able to see that back then as even a, a possibility? Absolutely not. It's just eventually after being in Las Vegas, I got into corporate America, not even realizing it was corporate America. So I like to be hands-on. I like to work with my people and, you know, touch things that are important. You know, sitting, pushing around a pen or, you know, playing on the computer is great. And I think there's a time and place for that. But you have to be with your people and you, and you have to be passionate and, and, and work together. Thank you. Lee, can you talk about, you know, people talk about, you mentioned Jean-Louis Paladin. Who, I don't know if everyone knows who Jean-Louis was, but he was a amazing chef who came over to the U.S. I think in 79 and uh, Jean-Louis at the Watergate in D.C. Um, real legend of the time. Uh, the, simply the best chef I ever met, period, to this day. Really? No doubt about it, yeah. Um, so, you know, you talked, people were coming to you looking for things they needed. Does that still happen? Are there still, do you still get a curveball now and then, something that you guys aren't already doing in this extensive program you have? Do you still get special requests or things that you have to seek out and figure out how to provide to people? Absolutely. And, you know, just to follow up, I mean, Jean-Louis, if you guys don't know, I know a lot of people are younger and we're getting older, so you might not know who he is, but look him up, read about him. I mean, some of the stuff he was doing in the 70s is still relevant today. But yeah, we get every single day we get a call from a chef because it's just kind of we've come, become that source of can you find it? And, and it's kind of our DNA. We have a whole R&D team that's just looking for and, and growing Do you have things. ice lettuce? Ice lettuce, yes. Sure. I need some of that. Call me. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah, but it's, it's just a, It it's tastes a like oysters, so it's a succulent. It is. It's, it's, I... I, I Started in Ireland, actually. Um, Dorina Allen's, that woman's nuts, but I love her. She has this, her garden, like, and she grows everything. And I was like, what is that? It tastes like oysters, but it's, uh, oh, it's delicious. So I'm, yeah. I need some, okay? I'm calling I mean, It's the world we live in, the sexiest, fun stuff, flavors, flavor, flavor. No shit. Always. I love it. Put I mean, that with abalone and fucking almonds. That's going to be nice. I'm getting hungry. I think I'm getting hungry. I'm sorry. I'm We're almost there. We're almost so there. So sorry, guys. I, before I offer, does anyone have questions? Because I'm happy to take them. Yes? Okay. Anyone else? All right. Well, come, why don't you come meet me halfway and we'll do that. Um, I was just curious for the farmer. Um, I mean, obviously, there's a big event like this for people who want to be chefs, but how hard is it to 
you know, try and motivate people to be a farmer and to go into that sort of agricultural realm. Andrew, can you restate that? I couldn't hear him. Oh, yeah. Hearing is the second thing to go when you get to be an old geezer like me. Sorry. Um, so I was curious. Uh, so I feel like it's fairly more widespread to motivate people to be chefs and to be cooks. Uh, how do you get people interested in your realm of the agriculture business and to be a farmer? Oh, I think it's happening. I think that there are, I mean, you can, you can look at a, a huge decline in the number of American farms but also I think we're now finally seeing that bottom out and you're seeing a huge resurgence. There are more farmers markets today in the history of the United States than there have been since the beginning of the United States and that's a credit to what these chefs did early on in the 70s and 80s and drove that market and now we're finally at the point where you're seeing that demand and the farmers markets increasing. The farmer, there's young people that are leaving careers and going into farming. Of course there's the old joke of uh, how do you make a million dollars in farming? And that's to start with five million. But uh, you know, there's a, there, there is, there's a huge influx of young farms, farmers coming in. It's happening. It, you guys did it. You guys started this revolution. No, you made us look good. <laughs> you, made you allowed us that privilege. Well, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, so um, can we just bring this all to, by the way, I've heard that same joke about the restaurant business. Um, although 10 million usually. The Jean-Louis? <laughs> The uh, start with, you know, to make a million. Start oh, yeah, with, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, can we just bring this um, to the present day for a minute? There was a real um, spirit of adventure when you guys were all coming up. There was a real um, sp uh, spirit of, I think, uh, courage, jumping into a profession that was largely untested in this country. Um, there was such, uh, sometimes it went too far, but, uh, you know, experimentation, uh, trying new things. I, I think there's a lot of cynicism around the restaurant business right now, why people are getting into it. Um, uh, you know, certainly in New York where I live, there's a, a lot of frustration about sort of the, the sameness of a lot of restaurants, especially in Manhattan. I think that's one of the reasons why Brooklyn has gotten so much traction. But do you all, and I'll just throw this out to the group, um, do you all see today in this country, whether it's a, a particular chef you admire, whether it's a particular uh, city uh, where there's a lot going on, do you see things going on today that are comparable, that, you, that remind you of the energy and the sort of spirit of the time when you all were? Absolutely. I, I think what really impresses me is that, you know, back in the 70s and early 80s, we did what we did because it made sense to us. It was just kind of the natural progression of things. I mean, I can speak for myself, but there was no big plan. We were just trying to cook good food and run good restaurants and do what we did and kind of figure it out. And, you know, when I look at the dining scene today, uh, it certainly changed, but I see more than ever people's abilities and people's, you know, desire to just try it their way. Chefs don't all wear white. Not every tablecloth is white. Uh, there's a lot more local stuff. Uh, there's certainly, I mean, the restaurant business is much more diverse than it used to be. And everywhere you go, in small towns and big towns, there's good food everywhere. And people are brave enough to try and do good stuff in little places. And I think that's really exciting. I'll be real quick. I love men I like reading menus. And so, I don't know, I walk around a city for two hours until I see a menu that says, that I'm like, oh my God, I gotta have that. I want, like, I wanna eat the whole menu. That is a huge part of your restaurant success. That, because you're writing your story and you're putting it out on a plate, menu to get people in, I'm sorry, that just gets me. And then I always go in the kitchen too to say thank you, and I can see if it's a well-run, you know, kitchen, clean, Respect, you know, all of that. Uh, thanks. Thank you. Bruce, anything? Well, you know, I think the biggest difference now is like 
uh, Ken kind of touched on is middle America and smaller towns. You can go to any little town in America now and find some little pocket of inspiration, some guy who's connected with a farmer, connected with local producers, and just have an epiphany. I went to St. Louis a couple years ago and had a couple of just amazing experiences there. And that was just a three-day trip I had, and I'm sure there's a lot more places like that. But I think the energy that all went to the cities has whatever, steeped and then gone back to other places. And now you just find incredible inspiration in the most unusual place, you know? So it's all over. Strip malls and everything. Yeah, thank it God the, the cities are too expensive to live in for most people who work in restaurants because it's now spreading out, you know, and becoming the, like the great eating that was in 19th century United States. I remember in the 60s, you could drive anywhere in the United States and go to a diner and they made their own pies, you know. Uh, then, of course, it all came corporate, but I think that is now changing, and it's going back to that. And I th so I think it's the m most exciting time ever. I used to go canning for Hojo's fried clams, Howard Johnson's fried clams. Oh, Ho As a kid, I'd, they were delicious. I'd beat up my friends if they didn't like wrap the Schlitz can with craft paper and follow my lead. We would go door to door for money. Was it, the wasn't fried the fried clams. clam a Jacques Pepin recipe? No shit. I, I believe mean, that was. Yes, he was the corporate was. chef. But they also, like, do you want just the bellies or next, you yeah. know, you had an option, which was kind of cool. Okay. Like, I didn't even know Jacques then, you know. Last question, bit of a softball, but it, it is interesting to me. You know, when I was working on the book, um, I was amazed. There's so many, you know, at a time when, I, and I always, I, I always say this on my podcast, things change, that I'm not judging how they've changed, I'm just saying it's very different now. At a time when very often chefs have moved, maybe they still own their restaurants, but have moved out of their own kitchens, right, into another area, very young, right? So many people of your guys' generation are still operating restaurants, are still cooking. Um, you know, I was at Barbudo Saturday afternoon, Jonathan Waxman was roaming around, you know, talking to people. Um, uh, I remember vividly for the book going to interview Cindy Paulson in Napa, in the Napa Valley on a Friday afternoon at like 5.30, and they sent me back to the kitchen where she was testing a dish. <laughs> um, can you speak to what keeps you in the kitchen? I, it's, is it because all this other stuff wasn't on the radar when you got into it, and it was just about, about the cooking? Well, I would say the kitchen's the most important place. and tasting food with staff and tasting food with each other and talking about what we're tasting, there's nothing more important than that. So it's a priority. And I think you just have to make sure you stick to your priorities. Kitchen is the best place to be. I mean, that's, I, I run a business all day and when we open the door at 5.30, the only place I want to be is the middle of the line driving Still. the bus. Only place I want to be. There's something about being in a kitchen with a team cooking food, serving people, orchestrating this organized chaos. And in a good Stressed kitchen, it's out always... Stressed fucking ass, too. It's no, like, it's fun. <laughs> but yeah, but, but you're it's always, good. You know, it's... When a kitchen runs great, it's a beautiful thing. Because you, you just, you've got this string you keep tight, and you're just, you're dodging bullets all night long. And most nights, we dodge all the bullets. And it feels great. It's, it's, there's nothing else like it. Grant? Yeah, I think it's, it's a pulse of a restaurant. I mean, making sure the soup is hot and the timing of food. It's, it's a buzz and it's, it's a natural high and I enjoy it very much. Overcome There's nothing all. better than that feeling on a... Well, Friday nights were always a bit dangerous, but on a Saturday night we did our biggest numbers and people showed up on time and left on time. When it's working like that, there's no greater adrenaline rush in the world. Not even pharmaceutical coke comes that well, you know. <laughs> All right, the, the restaurant business is a centrifuge going the wrong way. So it's your job to put your arms around it and hold it in. And there's no, the only place to do that from is the kitchen. Okay, before I thank everybody, I just have to mention, it's occurred to me somewhere in the last hour, I mentioned Jeremiah's book was also available now. Barbara's book as well, Out of Line, which I love. We did a long interview about it a couple years ago on the air. Um, uh, so I highly recommend Barber's as well. And we're out of time, so please join me in thanking Lee Jones, Bruce Hill, Jeremiah Tower, Grant McPherson, Ken Frank, and Barbara Lynch. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Sorry, and I didn't realize Grant McPherson also has a book, which I did not realize. So forgive me, Grant, but also available. Thank you. Can we get a group picture? Yeah, we should. All right, all right. I'm so sorry. Well, that was epic. But now we're about to get into a live performance. Talk about sex, drugs, and rock and roll. I got my boy Ruslan. Where's Chad Minton? Come up to the stage. We're going to give away some free True Cooks gear. But you have to make your way to the stage. Come up, come up. To my mouth right here. Check, check, check. My boy Ruslan travels the United States. You about ready? Here you go. Check, 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 check. Anti-food convention, convention. How you guys doing? We got some stuff to give away. How many people want some free swag? That's it. Oh, no. Oh, no. Can we get the track hat. up, please? Can we get the track up? Let's get the music up. We want the hat. We got some sticker packs. How many people want some sticker packs, some hats? My name is Ruslan. I got my man Av with me. Shout out to Chef's Roll. Hold on. This is what we're going to do. I get it to one man. I give it to one lady. Hold up. Hold up. Hold up. 